So welcome everybody to Marketplace Session 4 of Sustainable Earth 2021. Um, and we've got some a couple of really great speakers like So we've got Matt uh, Burnell um, um, and we've got Mariana Marchese. Um, and um, so first of all, I'll ask uh, Matt to uh, to join and then... Um, so hi. Um, so Matt, I'll just give you a, an overview of, of Matt. So Matt's based in Bristol. Um, He's a technical policy advisor, uh, research officer at the Reuse Network. Um, and his presentation will reflect on why reuse is at the heart of the circular economy um, and the elevated position of reuse within the waste hierarchy. Um, his presentation will also provide a synopsis of the nuts and bolts of running a reuse charity. So I'll hand over to you, Matt. Thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks to all the other speakers today over in the last few days. Uh, there's been some really interesting sessions. So I'm talking today about the heart of the circular economy, um, and as I'm setting from the Reuse Network. So um, by way of introduction uh, to myself, I'm actually an ex Plymouth graduate, graduating in 2011. Um, since then, I went on to study renewable energy, and I worked in the renewable industry down in Cornwall and Devon for about five years. In the process, I got qualified as an electrician. Um, and then lockdown last year, I um, used the time to found the UK's first reuse organisation looking at solar. And that got me involved in the world of uh, we, uh, we and reuse. Um, so here I am today talking about the reuse network um, with all the interesting things that have been going on. So first, I'm just going to be introducing the reuse network. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about the threats and opportunities for reuse going forward. So this diagram here uh, is the represents the circular economy, and we can see really where reuse sits within the circular economy. And you see it sits in between distribution and collection, and therefore this makes it quite a, a logistics-based industry. Um, we are on the waste hierarchy. We are above recycling, um, but this isn't always reflected in policy and in in terms of funding and education. Um, and reuse has always been somewhat of the periphery of the circular economy um, in terms of policy. Um, and but I, I would argue this is actually reuse is actually at the heart of what the circular economy is. Um, and um, so, really, in terms of being at the heart of, of the circular economy, the reuse network represents 100 charities across the UK. Um, we've been going for 32 years, and um, in terms of what we do for our members, um, the, the the first thing we all of our members do is work to alleviate poverty in the work they do in their communities. Um, in the process, we we reduce the amount go, of waste going to landfill. Um, we offer support for our members. So, for example, when COVID came along, we were providing advice as to how to stay open and carrying on their, the, the services for their community. Um, and tied to this is guidance that we provide um, to advise the, our members on how to do, comply with, with their product regulations um, and ensuring that reuse products are all safe uh, for the members of the public when they, when they buy them. Um, also, we provide networking for our members. So we have weekly, weekly sessions, we have um, monthly seminars, we have our conference on the 11th of November. And we very, very much an information sharing based group of people. Um, so, yeah, if there's any any organisations out there who are interested in, in joining, um, it's, it's well worth considering. Um, we also provide commercial partnerships. Um, so uh, with the likes of John Lewis and Dixon's, this enables us to get uh, stock for for our members. Um, and then as we've been going for, for 30 years, um, we provide a voice in terms of trying to change government policy, um, commenting on government policy um, and, and involved in, in lobbying for the reuse industry. So um, these are two of our brilliant partners who we work with. Um, and the way it, it generally works is if you were to buy a fridge or a mattress or an item from, from one of our partners, um, they'll ask you, what, what are you doing with your old one? They will then arrange for that that um, old fridge, for example, to be take, to be picked up and um, processed at one of our reuse centres. Um, so you see here John Lewis picking up some furniture from SW1 and uh, 
Dixons have been really, really on the game with reuse, and they've actually linked their uh, Christmas bonus to to reuse. Um, so you know, there's some organisations who are doing really, really, really well with reuse, and um, we're happy to work with them. And in terms of the products that we sell, um, a whole mixed bag really. We uh, provide electrical items, um, office clearances, paint. Um, IT has been a, a big part of, uh, of what we do and growing as, as the pandemic has, has hit and the digital divide has become more apparent. And then all the other bespoke things like pallets, um, T-shirts, hospital beds. I think this week we even got an offer for, for um, toilet brushes. So, you know, real, real mixed bag of, of items that, we, um, that our members process and reuse. And in terms of going back to being the heart of the, the reuse industry, um, these are the, t- the type of people that, that our members are doing it for. Um, so generally, the most you know, marginalised, vulnerable people in society um, who, who, who our charities um, support. So without, without the work that they do, a lot of these services will be passed on to local authorities. Um, so there's also a large economic aspect of what we do and provide for for um for for the taxpayer and looking at social impact um this is from our social impact report which you can download from our website you can see here some of the the, the amount of money that um, is involved so 427 million saved for uk households 1.5 million households helped in the uk um well worth a read so uh this is looking at the nuts and bolts of reuse and 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 what will happen to um, to the item if you were to don- donate it? So it is collected from one of uh, four places. Um, the uh, products are, are then processed and um, repaired, reused, upcycled. They're then ch- checked for check for product safety by competent technicians, um, pat tested, cleaned. Um, what can't be used is then sent to the waste stream. Um, and then these items are resold on the market, either in shops or more and more online, um, or donated to households in furniture poverty. And then all these pro- profits fund vital community projects, um, which, which our members are involved with. So um, wouldn't be doing geography without looking at a case study. So we've got here with um, Newbury Community Resource Centre. They process things like fridges, freezers. They build furniture. They process um, and process test bikes. Um, they've been going for 20 years. Uh, they provide critical day services and training for vulnerable adults as well and um, volunteering and, and get back to work schemes. And during COVID, they were providing food parcels for, for vulnerable parts of the community. And all this funds community projects such as community gardens and um, river restoration. So that's uh, what, what Reuse Network is. And now looking at the challenges and opportunities for reuse. So one of the major ones which we keep on hearing is training and competency. Um, it's a really big issue for the industry. As things stand, there's no um, uh, qualification to become a repairer. It's all done very much through time served, um, bespoke areas of training. Um, and, and our members are, are really worried about the issue of succession, succession issues. So a lot of the technicians have been doing it for 40 years, now, now nearing retiring age. And the question is, who's coming through to replace them at the same time as, as we're pushing the sector economy agenda? Um, do we have the training and skills to actually do what we need to do? Um, so and this relates to some new policy, which, which is supposed to be coming out actually next week. So very topical. And this is um, the policy which will force manufacturers to publish technical details on their products. Um, And they specifically use the ambiguous term professional repairer. Um, And this this is ambiguous. So there's a space here for for reuse to define what professional repairer is. Um, But it could also throw up a kind of worms in terms of we don't have the nuts and bolts in place yet as, as a UK training provider. Um, so the next one really is the informal uh, reuse sector. So um, very well-meaning and um, you know, well-served uh, repair cafes. They provide a good social element for reuse. Um, 
However, there is a, a slight concern in the industry about some of the language which is being encouraged um, by by encouraging people, members of the public, to go and have a go at, at repair. At repair. Um, someone who speaking, someone who's an electrician, I, I I do worry about members of the public going out and fixing, being encouraged to go out and fix items themselves. Um, so this is this is a an area of concern. Um, and really, to to emphasise that point, um, unfortunately, the, the the tragic events of Grenfell Tower were started by a faulty crimp connection in a fridge freezer. And there's all sorts of questions of liability if we are encouraging members of the public to go and have a rego- have a go at repair. You know what we're going to see as the sector economy grows um, without um, having a qualification. So more more guidance is uh, needed for the industry. And um, this is something which I'm involved with. So we've been given funding by EcoSurety to um, write extensive guidance for the reuse industry. Um, this will bring the industry up to speed with the most up-to-date forms of guidance. Um, and it will also provide confidence for our partners that their products are being processed in a way um, that they are happy with and, and is compliant with with safety regulations. So watch this space. Um, we'll be launching this in early 2022. Um, the next opportunity really is the Waste Prevention Programme. And it's well worth reading. It's a 70-page document, but um, it's, it's being discussed at the moment, actually. And it's uh, got some really interesting proposals in it, including weighting financial incentives for reuse above recycling targets. Um, and also piloting local circular economy hubs via local enterprise partnerships and um, supporting the NICER, which is the NICER National Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Research Programme. Um, so there's all sorts of things that are in the pipeline for reuse. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's an, ex- an exciting time to be to be involved. Um, so certainly anyone in Plymouth who's, you know, looking at um, at this area, um, you know, do get in touch because um, it's an exciting time. Um, and then big business greenwash. I remember at Plymouth in 2011, we w- were learning about this and it's still an issue for the sustainability industry. Um, big businesses jumping on the circular economy bandwagon um, without, in my, in my opinion, without social benefits, it's not part of the circular economy it's simply recycling profits. And the if the charity sector doesn't step in and, and um, define what reuse is, it is gonna get, the space is gonna get occupied by big business. So this is one to watch out for, um, but it, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Um, and this is something which is fresh off the press for us. Um, we've just launched um, Reuse Home. Um, it's it's on a soft launch at the moment, so it's not officially been launched. Um, but this is essentially an ethical gum tree, um, which came about from our members wanting to um, to be able to sell on sell online during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, this is an area to watch really. And then finally, um, in terms of opportunities in the southwest. At the moment, there's no double ATFs, and a double ATF is an approved authorised treatment facility. Um, in, in Devon and Cornwall, there are only two of these with these licences. This is the licence you need to process electrical waste, um, and, and, and there aren't any in, in, um, that are doing reuse in, compared to other places. So I think with the funding coming through from, um, from the circular economy hubs, there could be a really interesting opportunity here for the for the southwest. Um, um, so you know, watch this space. Um, if this is something which is of interest to you, uh, do do get in touch. Um, so, a two minute warning, Matt. So I think um, actually that pretty much comes to the end of uh, of the presentation. Thank you, to everyone, for listening, and um, do. You, get in touch, um, follow us on social media as well for more updates. Um, and now happy to take any questions from you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Matt. That was yeah, really, really interesting talk. Um, 
yeah, it's really interesting to to find out a bit more about what the reuse network is. It sounds like you're doing really, really great stuff, uh, marrying the sort of social element to the the circular economy. Um, so we've got we've got some questions. Um, we've got a question on um, the carbon. So is there any focus on the carbon? I suppose the embedded emissions within the repair methodology. So when when stuff is being repaired by your technicians and reused um i suppose what's the is there any focus on that um is that something not really um if i'm honest it's 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 probably a bit too too periphery in terms of the actual day-to-day -day work that our technicians are doing um you know a lot of them are working on tight margins and um that may be an extra barrier or step i mean there is an opportunity to to look at how um, we electrical waste is is actually sort of transported, and I know there are organisations looking at that, um, but that's not something that we've we've kind of be, been looking at as of yet. Um, but you know, we are open to to ideas. Great, um, and I've got a question on on the the training of because we noticed you know you're talking about the importance of um, those those skills, those technical skills that are being lost. Um, so I've got a question here. What what training qualifications are available um, for the training of professional repairers? Um, and is this a gap that apprenticeships could meet? Um, yeah, so the, 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 the qualification, there is no official qualification. Um, it comes from different places at the moment, this moment in time. Um, so our, our partners, Dixon, Dixon's, they they've got a fantastic training facility um, which our members have been able to get access to, um, and that's that's over um, you know a number of weeks, um, and so so there's kind of training which can be done in terms of actually the nuts and bolts for fixing, for example, a washing machine. Um, but then there's also the other element in terms of the electrical side and, and being a qualified electrician. Um, you know, there there needs to be a, an actual qualification for 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 this. Uh, a lot of a lot of people on the ground have been working in th for three or four years in this area, um, but actually on paper wouldn't have anything anything to show for it compared to say an industry like plumbing um, or electrical or carpentry where there is a defined yeah, you can go to college one day a week uh, and so this is i think this is one of the most important aspects of, of the sector economy at the moment um and definitely something that that i could see growing but it's also a case of who's taking the lead on this um and it's it's almost like everyone else is saying oh it's it's their turn to do it it's, it's there but um you know it, it does also come down to funding um uh, as well and and um i, I think the terms of government policy they've been very uh, clear in terms of the direction with with where things are going in the waste prevention program but as always and I, I felt this the same in the renewable industry that the ideas go before the practicalities of, of how it's going to go on the ground um, and so you know training you can't just click your fingers and, and have training it takes two three four years to set up so we need to be doing that really right now in order to prepare, prepare for what's going to become in the, in the in the sector economy uh, and reuse into the future. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. So, so it's getting the infrastructure right behind it um, seems to be crucial. And I guess um, and I guess there's you know saying that there's real opportunities there, isn't there? Um, for absolutely. job you know job creation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, there's definitely a demand for it. I mean, we I, I, we get calls um, almost week in week out asking for training. Um, obviously, COVID has thrown a spanner in the works of, of everything, um, but I think if there's there's a demand for it, so the market will will respond. Um, but it's also a case of, of leadership and, and how that comes about. And so I think this is an this is an area which um, Reuse Network is going to be involved with going forward because it definitely has legs. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And there's another question here about how do you in enshrine these social benefits into the circular economy because you um you're talking mentioned you talk about um you know the the big boys sort of getting on board and perhaps there's a danger that the social benefits as well as the um the environmental benefits get get lost i suppose um 
the the guidance i guess that you would look to draw up is that something that you're thinking of including um in sort of a focus on enshrining those social benefits well there are already laws out there the the social value act um me that, that that's that's come through so there there should already be um social the social element should already be enshrined in in every activity we do um it's it's been more of in terms of policy it's been more of a an afterthought um which is a point which we as a reuse network we've been trying to, to bang on about for years about you know the social impact of what we of what we do um so in, in terms of kind of enshrining that i think i think it's a case of um making the point clearer in terms of the the, the value that we add to to society but also off the back of that you know the 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 money that's saved for the taxpayer in terms of, of the services which reuse via charities can can do. Brilliant. That sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks for your talk again, Matt. That was really, yeah, really, really interesting. And uh, and everybody at home will be really, yeah. Thank you. I'm looking forward to um, to Mariana's talk. And yeah. thanks to Zaf Tom and everyone else behind the scenes. Cheers, Matt. Okay, so now it's time for our second speaker. Um, so, hi, you, Mariana. Hi. So, Mariana um, Marchese is is uh, from the Welsh School of Architecture, based at Cardiff University. Um, she's an MSCA Fellow in um, a lecturer in Design and Innovation for Sustainable Development of the Built Environment. Um, she's principal researcher in Circu Bed Project for transition to a circular economy in urban communities through social innovation um, and a particular interest in supporting systemic change for sustainable development through uh, developing social, organisational and technological, technological innovations. So I'll hand over to you, Mariana. Thank you. I'm sharing the screen. OK. So thank you for this introduction. Um, I would like uh, to show you the results of my Marie Slavoska Individual Fellowship it is an European funded project called CIRCUBED and focus on a social innovation for a circular economy in uh, urban communities. The study focus on the problem that resource efficiency in cities depend on consumption and production patterns that are strongly linked to cities' in behavior. If you look at this chart, it shows the ecological footprint of Cardiff. You can see that almost 70% of the ecological footprint is due to residents' footprint food and drink consumption, mobility pattern, energy consumption, consumable and good use and consumption. These data uh, are also served in other cities in the UK. So we, from this data, we um, observe that uh, citizens have a strong impact on resource efficiency and use in city through their practice, production consumption practice, and their lifestyle and behavior. So the study focus on what drive cities in practice to prioritize circular production and consumption strategies like reducing, repairing, reusing, refurbishing. Uh, why? Because Currently, circular, while on one side we have seen that in a city for resource efficiency, citizen has a strong uh, impact for the behavior because of the behavior. On the other side, the circular economy is currently mainly focused on technological innovation, focus uh, mainly looking at new material, product, industrial technique and processes while there is a limited attention on social practice and citizen behavior. Mm, through literature, we observe 
that uh, people are more keen to change their social practice if they are involved in uh, um, collecting intervention with peer. These interventions are called social innovation. They are new products, services, processes, markets, platform, and organizational forms that engage citizens in alternative social practice. Uh, the literature allies tools that this intervention are able to engage citizens towards um, new uh, sustainable uh, living practice. Therefore, the study focuses on social innovation intervention that are able to engage citizens in circular production and consumption practice, looking at the design state, take state, make, as well as use and consume and dispose. We selected 56 social innovation intervention implemented in city in different key, key urban systems, food, product, mobility, and building. We collect different data, starting from resource input and output, the urban system implemented, sector, public, informal, uh, uh, private, no profit, the main problem address, the production or consumption practice implemented and current state, the engagement strategies applied, obstacle, circular economy action implemented, and main impact area. We uh, analyze a large variety of uh, uh, social innovation interventions, starting from um, growing community, uh, bike sharing, uh, space maker of Fab Lab, uh, uh, upcycle intervention like the big reduce, uh, virtual uh, platform, and uh, um, community energy. So, for a large variety of case study, we uh, develop a database. And based on this database, we uh, observe that uh, um, social innovation for a circular economy can be um, organized in uh, three main categories and seven types of social innovation. So we found that these three main categories uh, in which we organize the initiative that are focused, there are initiatives that are focused on alternative social setting, in which we found that the do it yourself citizen, sharing citizen, strategic citizen. They are mainly community or group of interest. We focus, we found another category that is mainly focused on individual competence. In this category, uh, we found the, the uh, innovation like uh, do it yourself citizen, sensor citizen. And finally, we found a last category that focus on alternative material arrangement. This uh, category uh, includes two main innovations, zero waste citizen and utility oriented citizen. In the third category, um, they are um, uh, initiatives are very mainly implemented by community and group of interest that promote uh, prosumption on alternative consumption practice. In the second category, they are mainly citizens that promote self production and uh, alternative consumption practice like, like repairing life product extension. In the last category, we found mainly social enterprise and business. They focus on developing uh, um, in intervention aimed at zero waste or um, uh, providing um, aim to provide service instead of 
uh, product ownership. This overview um, show a potential new concept in the circular economy of circular community composed of a variety of uh, citizens, group community, group of interest, social enterprise and business that uh, uh, implement circular production and consumption practice through circular solution combined with combined combined with the growth principle uh, to guarantee well-being for all within a planetary boundary we analyze in detail each type of uh, social innovation uh, allied in alternative practice and benefit so uh, in for in, in the case of the um, uh, do it together citizen this type of innovation is mainly implemented by community of place or interest that promote collaborative consumption or consumption in the building and food system they aim to reduce waste build new skills and developing uh, uh, promoting cohesion and community a sense of community ownership in the sharing citizen we saw group of interest that promote alternative consumption practice like sharing and exchanging exchanging of product building space and mobility modes with the aim to reduce waste and resource uh, consumption while uh, uh, promoting save of money and space in the strategic ship citizen we found a group that are built for short term they promote uh, product and short term of use uh, of public land and urban space they aim at uh, in increasing awareness and building group of interest in the do it uh, um, yourself citizen we found the innovative intervention that are mainly focused on self-production and alternative consumption uh, through product life extension they aim to reduce waste promote new skills and save money we found also an, a category we call um, uh, city uh, we call uh, uh, sensor citizen they uh, aim to produce knowledge uh, using sensor uh, in the sector of in the building food or mobility system to increase awareness and influence in the area finally the last two category uh, last two types are mainly non-profit group and business one is the uh, zero waste citizen they are intervention that help promote alternative production of product and food with the aim of re re reducing re resource use and waste, promoting cohesion and self-reliance. Uh, Final last type is composed of is promoted by not-profit group and business that promote alternative consumption, that uh, they uh, promote uh, service based on renting and letting of uh, building space and product with the aim to reduce uh, resources and waste, uh, save money and promote profit, profit for users also. We also observe common challenge. Uh, they need uh, the lack of access to infrastructure and support. They need generally the lack of, uh, the lack of sustainable business model. They need building human capacity and skills. And generally, they lack uh, of networking for resource circularity, while they are generally uh, linked with similar um, intervention. And uh, we also serve in a few, uh, most of them, uh, the uh, difficulties of understanding the real impact, therefore, to show uh, the benefit for having support. Um, through this analysis, uh, however, what um, we uh, um, can highlight is this intervention are able to um, can, uh, um, have a complementary role with uh, um, uh, current uh, uh, practice in the circular economy 
for the implementation of circular economy, if you see this diagram is showing a, the implementation of a circular economy in the product system. We map uh, social innovation opportunity in this area, and we found the intervention applied in the design stage, take, make, use, in different uh, um, practice, lighting, uh, up repairing, re reusing, upcycling, and material recovery. Uh, so, uh, social, uh, this type of intervention can, uh, con can uh, be combined with uh, um, upstream intervention to implement uh, a circular economy. Um, therefore, we suggest to extend the current resolve uh, framework applied in the circular economy uh, to uh, introduce a new strategy. Uh, the engaging power strategies that is specifically uh, um, helping in implementing social innovation. And we have combined it with current circular economy action and with uh, to highlight social innovation opportunity for a circular economy. So uh, the engage and power strategies combined with the generic uh, as uh, identified community gardening growing and composting initiative, urban farming, community supported agriculture. In the shared strategies, we found intervention like shared community initiative, uh, co-housing, community hub, shared facility like carpooling. In the optimized strategy, we found self-big community, self-production facility, collective purchase uh, group. In the loop strategies, we found repair cafe and platform, reuse center, up cyclone, up cycling and closed loop uh, food initiative. In the virtualized strategies, we found the platform, virtual platform for, for resource reuse, knowledge production, networking, and the supply chain. In the exchange strategy, we found initiative like uh, community energy that promote uh, the use of renewable source use, new business model like community bike, an initiative that pro promote advanced uh, technology. Future step, the research is developing a car game prototype to engage, uh, to test playful practice in engaging citizens on a uh, collect collaborative discovery on possibility scenario for a circular economy by social innovation. Moreover, uh, through this experience, we would like to identify preliminary recommendations for support strategy as measure to be implemented in uh, policy making to support social innovation for a circular economy. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free uh, to ask. That was great, Mariana. Thank you for your talk. I'm sure everybody at home really enjoyed that. It was uh, yeah, fascinating to um, to hear about the, your research and and yeah, your Thank your you. expertise. It was really interesting. So I'll just bring up some questions. Um, so what have we got? Um, so um where was where was the research conducted and how do you think um the place in terms of do you think your um your findings i suppose are are they particular to an urban area or are they particular yeah. to uh, a rural is that something that you yes i'm in order to select the case study i define three um, uh, I define criteria for selection. So they are intervention mainly implemented in cities. They are intervention that involve uh, urban community, uh, citizens. So you have a different category. There are intervention that are uh, implemented by community, but there are intervention like business or social enterprise that involve community in this practice. And uh, I focus on intervention that are developed in developed country uh, in order to be able to uh, comp comp compare them. 
and also a definite clear period. So um, they are interventions that are very well established and spread. So I, um, I, I haven't considered recent innovation because uh, maybe they are not uh, yet well established. So it's difficult to, to for, uh, for very much, uh, I need also to understand the obstacle impact and that these data are not currently available. Uh, so that criteria help me to um, define the uh, like the, um, the case study that uh, uh, I could consider for the, uh, the project. Brilliant. Thank you, Mario. Um, so I suppose we've got another one here. This is talking about um, how can empowerment be in achieved? Um, is it a simply a matter of so talked about the, the social um, innovation and the support from um, from policy, from from government. How can, do you think, it, is, it, is it a matter of simply funding or um, no. is it complicated? I think it's not only a matter of funding. I think uh, there, is, uh, um, there are different tasks that depend on the, the uh, obviously, the, the type of thing, engagement. In case of community, I uh, see the need of a facilitation. Uh, several interventions uh, uh, were uh, developed uh, thanks to facilitators. While in case of business, business and social enterprise, built the idea and engage local community. So there are um, several um, interventions that are very well established that uh, have established an, an, a balance between uh, uh, them and the community, and they both benefit from working together. Um, so I think policy make, maker can help, help in terms of financial support, but also I think there is a, a need of building skills, mm, because, uh, for example, uh, most of the intervention need uh, uh, um, the development of business, uh, uh, sustainable business model. So what I found, the, the best practice, there are a few, work very well because they have developed a well-established, uh, a defined uh, business model. Um, and finally, uh, I think, um, uh, what I see, I think, uh, um, compare the current approach in the circular economy, uh, social innovation has a, 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 a strong potential to be complementary, not only because uh, can uh, promote uh, behavioral change, but also because uh, I noticed that uh, while in the circular economy, the approach focus on thinking about uh, uh, Grow that uh, is um, can uh, be for other for uh, so is a um, grow. We suppose that the resources are infinite. In the case of uh, social innovation, um, there is a, a, um, a, a concept of uh, the grow in which they try to uh, consider also limits in um, of resources and try to benefit in. Uh, stakeholders involved. So I, I think in this approach, uh, there is a potential to overcome current limits in the circular economy approach, but by engaging this concept into the circular economy. So a uh, policy maker, maker can, have a, 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 can be helpful in promoting this concept. Obviously, I'm still in the research, I'm still, um, uh, I need to work further on providing evidence of it. But uh, based on evidence, I uh, think that uh, policy making uh, can be engaged for uh, building on this concept and working with that. I think on one side, industry can have a role, but I think uh, social innovation can have another big role in the plate. Thank you, Mariana. That's a really interesting answer. 
Um, yeah, that gets me thinking as well about, uh, I suppose you were talking about um, the facilitator being really important in building those skills. Um, is that something then that you think um, that, that um, needs to come from um, policy makers? Um, I guess it, it, it sort of, I suppose it chimes with some of what Matt was saying actually about the some of the infrastructure being, yes, I, being, being on the ground. Yes, I think not only policymaker, but also imagine institution. For for example, my research I mainly also focused on social housing because I was specifically um, looking at how to implement the circular economy in social housing, and from there I extend the research. So, if you imagine social housing, uh, social housing association can directly benefit because the community that are engaged in this activity can reduce waste that they need to manage inside so uh, also institution not necessarily necessarily policy maker can benefit in, in building and supporting this infrastructure thank you marianne that's great mm -hmm. i said i'm going to bring matt in here actually because we've got a couple of questions and i think we'll it's obviously there's lot, lots of crossover between the talks um so i've just just after i introduced marianne i got a couple of questions for you matt so i don't know if, if that's okay if i um yeah, switch yeah. To a couple of questions um so first we've got simon and he was saying um and uh, basically uh, sh shouldn't we be encouraging training um consumers to do the simple repairs i.e uh computer printer cleaning contacts um etc so i suppose this question is yeah um obviously leave the the hard work to trained professionals but can we can we get the consumers to do the repairing um the problem is what do you define as simple and where does that road take you um so i don't think i i i don't i think with with the with the amount of products that are coming onto the market now, I mean, living in Bristol, you see all these scooters uh, zooming about. As an example, you know, where are we? Where do we draw the line between, you know, a, a simple product like a phone? Yeah, okay. Um, do we do it based on the amount of voltage that it can can uh, do damage to you? You know, what what's the where's the threshold? Um, and I think it's more looking at the the process and and um, Sort of bringing the consumer in on that journey, um, rather than rather than and, and, and making it more accessible, um, rather than just 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 sort of going yes, no, yes, no. I think it needs to be more more holistic than that. Okay, that's great. And, and uh, another question, um, which is, I suppose, what ki kind of items are currently the priority in terms of um, the the circular economy and, and re reuse? Um, so in terms of electrical, which is mainly what I'm looking at, um, it's still, uh, you yeah, know, the, the big, big white, white fr you know, fridges, the washing machines, um, dishwashers, those items. Um, on the furniture side, it's um, looking more at you know, mattresses, um, uh, yeah, general domestic projects. Um, there is an, also an interesting uh, development which is going on um looking at, at uh, what's in what's actually in a uh, in, in a, in a furniture um and the question of you know is there um particles in in the furniture which will uh make it difficult to refurbish later on that's the conversation which is going on at the moment with the environment agency um so kind of watch that space in terms of what the journey that different products go on that's great. But I think we're almost up at uh, time-wise. Sorry, is this, is, we could probably keep discussing the importance of uh, um, both subjects, um, w which are very interrelated, which is really interesting. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you both again for, for, for giving talks. It was really interesting. And I'm sure everybody at home will um, show their appreciation um, and they really enjoyed it. So, yeah, thanks again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.